Buckle up and hold on. At our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real, it is living, it is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but He is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that He really died on a cross, and that He really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Good morning, Connected. Thank you for being here with us. We just want to welcome you into our space here together and into our worship together. And let's pray so we can worship the Lord as one body today, Lord. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives. We thank you for this time together. We ask that you be present here, Lord. We ask that your music or, or your spirit be in this music and in our worship, Lord, in our hearts as we sing to you in Jesus' name. Sounds a new beginning as distant hearts begin believing. Redemption's bid is unrelenting. Your love goes on. Your love goes. up for chasing shadows you gave the world a light to follow a hope that shines beyond tomorrow your love goes on
Peering through the veil of darkness Breaking every chain you set us free Fighting for the furthest heart you gave Your life for all to see Tearing through the veil of darkness Breaking every chain you set us free Fighting for the furthest heart Your love, your love is relentless
holds your heart What stirs your soul What matters come to mind The cares you keep The thoughts you think it's not all wasted time So seek and you will find Joy still comes in the morning Hope still walks with the hurting You're still alive and breathing Praise the Lord Don't stop dancing and dreaming Still good news worth repeating So lift your head and keep singing Praise the Lord The years roll by We wonder why We lost our way from home The Father finds child inside we had left the growing old oh, oh. awake 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 my soul joy still comes in the morning hope still walks with the hurting you're still alive and breathing praise the Father God, we thank you so much for this ability to worship you. We thank you so much that even what appears to be all these obstacles in the way of reaching out and being in your presence, that you are bigger than that and that you are able to actually reach into each of our homes and each of our venues and each of our ways of watching, whether it be on a phone or a computer or a television, that you are able to still work in the midst of all of those things, Lord. And we are so grateful for you this morning. We're grateful for the worship. We're grateful for the songs that sing about your promises and your power. Lord, we ask that you bless our time together as we begin to tackle somewhat difficult things. I ask that 
you make my words clear and concise and that everything is for your glory this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, in our opening video that we play every single week, it warns you that you might possibly hear a very dangerous message, but in a safe place. So we are here to be a safe place today, and this message might be a little bit dangerous. <laughs> we are in our uncertain series, and as we journey through this uncertain series, we are taking some biblical characters, and we are looking at some of the things they did in their life, and we are seeing those principles and applying those principles to our lives. Remember, we are not taking our lives and thrusting them into the book. We, we, as we talk about Daniel today, we're not going to be talking about what your lion's den looks like uh, because it was an actual lion's den that, that Daniel was thrown into. We're not going to be talking about what your furnace was that you've been thrown into. We are actually going to be looking at the book in its historical context and seeing the truth that then can be applied to our lives how we are living right now. And as I say that, I just want to let you know that there's some very complicated things. Daniel is not an easy book. It, it, Daniel is a book that's a, bot, like, a lot like Revelation, that um, it's a lot of dreams and a lot of interpreting and things like that. So this is not going to be an easy book. And with that in mind, we're going to dive in, but I'm going to let another group kind of dive into that a little bit more. You'll see in a little bit. But uh, So what I want to do is I want to start, let's start in Genesis. And we're going to start with how God created, and God created with his intention of everything being the way that it was, and it was perfect, and he walked amongst his people. And this is how God created. Well, the story unfolds. We know that Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden. Life happens. Noah happens. The rain comes. And then we get this story of Abraham, who gets called to go. And then through his lineage, we get this Jacob. And through Jacob, we get the story of Joseph. And we know that Joseph gets sold into slavery and he ends up in Egypt. Well, after Joseph stays faithful to God and he is, he is raised up to second in command of Egypt, we have this story where he brings his family to live there in Egypt. So then we have these stories unfolding of what the Hebrew people went through underneath this oppressive empire of Egypt. So Egypt was... The, the empire to be at that time. They, they, they were the ruling authority in the world and they had a grip on these Hebrew people and they made them into slaves because their numbers got so big, they began to feel threatened by that. And as they felt threatened, the, the Pharaoh of the land put out a decree that he was to kill, that they were to kill all Hebrew children under the age of two. And what that would do is that would basically take all the male children and there would be a gap there, and it would be weeding out the population, so they couldn't rise up and conquer Egypt at some point. And so we have this ruling authority that is going to now use its oppressive authority to weed out people and, and make sure that they can stay in power. Okay, that's going to be very important in this, because then we have in the next book of Exodus... We have the story of God who hears the cry of the oppressed, who hears the cry of his people, reaches into the story, delivers them out of Egypt, and after trials and tribulations and time and wandering, he gives them their own nation that's been promised to them. And in this nation, they are told they are called out of Egypt to be a blessing to the world. When Abraham was called to go, God says, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. And so Israel was supposed to be this different kind of kingdom. It was going to be a theocracy where only God was the king. They didn't need a king like everybody else because they had this close relationship with God. He was in the tabernacle and then he was in the temple and he was among them and he walked amongst them just as he did in the garden. And so they didn't need a king. Well, the people got restless. And they looked around and they said, everybody else has a king and look how they're thriving. We want a king. And so God grants them the desires of their heart and gives them a king. And in doing so, we have from then on out this story of rebellion and Israel. And that rebellion is rooted in this unhealthy nationalism to where Israel actually becomes their God. The nation of Israel becomes the God that they serve. And then they in turn become oppressors of their world. And so 
we are in this, this is what's leading up to what's going to happen as the exile into Babylon takes place. Okay, I just want you to understand that God created us and the nation of Israel, created the nation of Israel to be a theocracy that relied completely and totally on him. And when, we, when, when the nation of Israel decided that their king was more important or their country was more important, then God sent in the Babylonians to take over and to actually exile some of the Jews living in Israel. So that's where we are right now. And now, I believe that this book is so complicated that if I tried to go through the entire thing, we would still be here at 5 o'clock tonight, and I know that none of you want that. So what I want to do is there is a group called The Bible Project. It's amazing stuff. You can watch their stuff online, or you can go to BibleProject.com. They do this great job of summarizing these very complicated issues. So what I want to do is I want to show you. It's an eight-minute video. And, and, but, it, but it's going to set a very good foundation for where we're going to end today. So I want to show you this video from the Bible Project and let them kind of explain to you how Daniel works and what the point of Daniel is. So sit tight, just over eight minutes, and we'll, we'll check out this video. Book of Daniel. The story set right after Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem, and they had plundered the city and its temple and taken a wave of Israelites into exile. Among them were four men from the royal family of David, Daniel, who's later named Belteshazzar, and his three friends, who you probably know by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This book tells of their struggles to maintain hope in the land of their conquerors. The book's design seems pretty simple at first. Chapters 1 through 6 contain stories about Daniel and his friends in Babylon, while chapters 7 through 12 contain the visions of Daniel about the future. But this two-part shape is made even more interesting by another design feature, and that's the book's language. It begins in Hebrew, the language of the Israelites, but chapters 2 through 7 are written in Aramaic, a cousin language to Hebrew spoken widely among the ancient empires. But then in chapters 8 through 12, it goes back to Hebrew. This design shows how chapters 2 through 7 are a coherent section, but it also highlights the importance of chapters 2 and 7 for understanding the later chapters of the book. Let's just dive in. Chapter 1 introduces the basic tension of the first half of the book. Daniel and his friends, they're really wise and capable, and they're recruited to serve in the royal palace of Babylon. But they're pressured to give up their Jewish identity by living and eating like Babylonians and violating the Jewish food laws found in the Torah. So they refuse, and they choose faithfulness to the Torah, and it puts them in danger. But God delivers them, and they end up being elevated by the king of Babylon. After this begins the Aramaic section, which you'll see has this really cool symmetric design. So first the king of Babylon has a dream that it turns out only Daniel is able to interpret. It's about a huge statue made of four types of metal and it symbolizes a sequence of kingdoms and the head is Babylon. But then a huge rock comes flying in and it shatters the statue and it becomes this huge mountain. Now this dream is the first of many symbolic visions in the book and this one introduces the basic storyline of them all. Daniel says that the statue represents a train of human kingdoms following from Babylon and they will all fill God's world with violence. But one day God's kingdom will come and will confront and humble the arrogant kingdoms of this world and fill the world with the healing justice of God's reign and rule. After this, chapter 3 tells the famous story of Daniel's three friends who refuse to bow down and worship a huge idol statue, which, like the statue in chapter 2, represents the king and his imperial power. And so the friends are persecuted, they're thrown into a fiery furnace, but God delivers them from death and they're exalted by the king who now acknowledges their God as the true one. After this come a pair of stories about two Babylonian kings, the father, Nebuchadnezzar, and then his son, Belshazzar. They're both filled with pride because of their imperial power. And so, like in chapter 2, God warns them both through dreams and then visions, which, also like chapter 2, only Daniel can interpret. He says that both kings are to humble themselves before God, and both kings arrogantly resist. So Nebuchadnezzar is stricken with madness. He becomes like a beast in the field. But then he humbles himself before God, and his humanity returns to him. He's restored as king. 
This is in contrast with his son, Belshazzar, who doesn't humble himself before God, and he's assassinated that very night. Now, these two stories draw this imagery from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and Psalm 8, where humans are depicted as the royal image of God. He's given them authority to rule over the beasts of the field and the birds of the air on behalf of God, who is the world's true king. But when human kingdoms forget that, when they rebel and make themselves and their power into a god, they become less than human, like violent beasts who will face God's justice. Which brings us to chapter 6, the pair of chapter 3. And this time it's Daniel who's being persecuted because he refuses to pray and worship the king as a god. And so like the friends, he's sentenced to death and he's thrown into a lion's den. But God delivers him from the beasts and like the friends, the king exalts Daniel and praises his god. Which brings us to chapter 7. It's the pair of chapter 2 and the center of the book where all its themes come together. It's another dream, but it's Daniel's this time. And ironically, he can't understand the dream until an angelic messenger explains it to him. He sees a series of four beasts, one like a lion, then like a bear, then one like a winged leopard, each of these symbolizing an arrogant kingdom. And last of all is a super beast, identified as a really evil empire. And it has lots of horns, a common symbol for kings in the Old Testament. And there's one specific horn who is an image of an arrogant king who exalts himself above God and persecutes God's people. Now they are symbolized by a figure called the Son of Man, who's an image for both God's covenant people, but also for their king from the line of David. But then all of a sudden, God, who's called the Ancient of Days, comes and he sets up his throne. He destroys the super beast and he exalts the Son of Man on the clouds where he comes up to sit at God's right hand and share in God's rule over the nations. We can look back now and see how all of these stories in the first half fit together. The three stories of faithfulness despite persecution, these are meant to offer hope to God's suffering people among the nations. But they suffer because human kingdoms have rebelled against God and have become beasts. And so these visions encourage patience, that God's people are to wait for him to bring his kingdom and rule over our world and vindicate his suffering people. But it raises the question about when God is going to do that, and that that's what these final three visions set out to explore. In chapter 8, Daniel has another vision about the final two beasts of chapter 7, but this time they're symbolized by a ram, who we're told is the image of the empire of the Medes and Persians, and then by a goat, who's an image of ancient Greece. And out of the goat come a whole bunch of horns, one of which symbolizes the evil king from chapter 7. And we're told more about him, that he will attack Jerusalem and exalt himself above God and defile the temple with idols. However, in the end, he will be destroyed by God, who will exalt his people and his kingdom. Now by chapter 9, Daniel is very puzzled, especially as to when all of this is going to take place. And so he consults the scroll of the prophet Jeremiah, where God said that Israel's exile would only last 70 years. So for Daniel, the 70 years is almost up. And so he asks God to fulfill his promise soon. But an angel comes and informs him that Israel's sin and rebellion has continued. And so their time of exile and oppression will continue on seven times longer than Jeremiah envisioned. Daniel is deeply disturbed by this, and he has one final vision. We're shown the same sequence of kingdoms. It's Persia, then Greece, and Alexander the Great, followed by lesser kings, all leading up to this final king of the north, who will invade Jerusalem, set up idols in the temple, and exalt himself above God. But then, all of a sudden, this king comes to ruin. Now, there's been endless debate about what all of these visions refer to. Many see a clear connection to the exploits of the Syrian king Antiochus in the 160s BC. He killed many faithful Jews in Jerusalem and set up idols in the temple. Others think it points forward to the Roman Empire's role in the execution of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. And still others think it will be fulfilled in future events that have yet to happen when Jesus will return. Now the problem is that the symbols and the numbers, they don't quite match any of these views perfectly. But it opens up the possibility that in a sense they are all right. The book of Daniel has been designed to offer hope to all future generations of God's people. It did so in the days of Antiochus' empire, and it has ever since. 
This is why Jesus could use imagery from Daniel to describe and confront the oppressive leaders he confronted in Jerusalem. This is why John the visionary who wrote the Revelation could adapt Daniel's visions and apply them to Rome of his day and also all future oppressive empires. And so the point of Daniel is that all generations of readers can find here a pattern and a promise. It's a pattern that human beings in their kingdoms become violent beasts when they glorify their own power, when they redefine right and wrong, and don't acknowledge God as their true king. But Daniel also holds out a promise that one day God will confront the beast. He will rescue his world and his people by bringing his kingdom over all nations. And so for every generation, this book speaks a message of hope that should motivate faithfulness. And that's what the book of Daniel is all about. So that's the book of Daniel in a nutshell or in a comic strip or however you want to call it. It's just really neat how they were able to tackle some of these issues that I wanted to get to but I knew that I wouldn't have time. The parallels and the story and how uh, the first six chapters they kind of line up very cool in the three different languages the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek that it translates into. All of these concepts are, are very important but the thing that I really want to dive into, we, we know chapters one through six, right? Those stories are taught in Sunday school, whether it's Daniel that refuses to eat the diet that the king forces upon him in chapter one, or when you go into chapter two and we have the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which by the way, isn't it unique, isn't it interesting that they're still called by their slave names that Babylon gave them and not by their Hebrew name. But then we have that story of the fiery furnace. And then we get these, the, 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 the six stories of obedience, Daniel praying, Daniel in the lion's den. We get all of these stories that come in the first six chapters. It's, it's setting up this premise that even though Daniel and his friends were taken into a foreign land and they, they had to live amongst a people that were not their people, they were still able to keep their allegiance to the Most High God. Now, uh, what, what I want you to understand here is that Daniel is not a rebel. It, it, Daniel is not there to start insurrection. Daniel is just being obedient. And we start to see this pattern form in the book of Daniel of civil disobedience, but informed by faithful conscience to God. So everything that Daniel does is not to start a rebellion. Everything that Daniel does is simply out of obedience to his God. And as, as we see these six chapters unfold, we see what that does for him and how he is rewarded by his consistency. He continues to be faithful to God in everything that he does. And all of a sudden we see him exalted into the courts of the king, much like Joseph was as he stayed faithful. He was, he was rewarded this position where now he's rising up and he's, he's able to sit in the room with the king and interpret these dreams. The most, the, the most intimate of places. Daniel is invited in to the bedchambers of the king. At any moment, Daniel could have grabbed a sword and ended this. But remember, this is not about rebellion. This is totally about God being honored by his obedient people. What Daniel boils down to is allegiance. Daniel did not claim allegiance to Babylon. He kept his allegiance to God throughout all of this. And we'll see where that's important. Well, you did see as the video unfolded, you saw what happens when empires get too strong and they become the, the, the force, right? The video they referred to as the beasts, right? And, and we talk about these four beasts that Daniel sees, interprets out of the dream. These four beasts that come up, these four major empires that begin to take over. And, and as the video pointed out, it's when an empire or a person or a king gets corrupted and all of a sudden now we are no longer about humanity, we're now about power and in doing so, we lose our humanity, we become these beasts that we're talking about. This is why it's so important that through all of this, Daniel doesn't just simply go, all right, king, now that I'm in this place, let's rule this thing together. No, he keeps his obedience. There, there's a point in scripture in the, in the book of Daniel where he says, I don't want to tell you some of this stuff, but this is what their dream means. And, and he is obedient to the interpretation that God gives him to share with the kings of Babylon. The whole time, his allegiance is to one, and that is God. 
Now that is what's so important. So we get into this in chapter 7, um, in verses 1 through 3. This is what the, the, the interpretation is. It says, In the first year of Balthazar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind. So this is Daniel's dream, his mind. As he was lying in bed, he wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up to the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Okay, so as the video shared with us, and as, as a common interpretation of the book of Daniel says, these beasts represent four separate kingdoms that were powerhouses in that day. Now, now notice how they're called beasts, just like how the king was turned into, he went, he went crazy and he, he became, he became beast-like until he repented and his allegiance went to God and then he was restored where his son, on the other hand, did not repent and did not do anything and he was actually executed. And so we have this, this imagery of these beasts rising up, these empires rising up that tend to take over by force and by power. And whenever you take over by force and by power, you are always going to have to oppress someone. If you win by force, someone is oppressed. And so here we have Daniel with this dream, and he is interpreting it to mean these four kingdoms. It goes on to say in verse 15, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So this is understood that he approaches an angel, that's part of the dream, and he says, hey, what's going on? This is, this is crazy. And he says, so he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. Isn't that interesting? These aren't Daniel's interpretations. This is an interpretation given to him by an angel sent by God. This is what it says. The four great beasts... The four great beasts are, I'm sorry, the four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. This is that moment in the video where we see that the Most High God comes and defeats the greatest beast and then has the Son of Man, which isn't that interesting that Jesus calls himself the Son of Man often, uh, has the Son of Man rise to the right hand of the Father and they rule forever and ever. This is the kingdom that we are aligned to. This is the place where our allegiance lies first to the Most High God. Just as Daniel was in another place living in a different, by different rules and trying to figure out how to stay obedient or how to keep his allegiance to God in the midst of everything else that was being pulled around him. This is where we live too. So let's take this story of Daniel. Let's take his faithfulness. Let's take the, the, the first six chapters and look at those and see what we can glean out of that character to be able to have so we can live amongst different rules in a different place that is requiring different things maybe than the kingdom is. Now, I know some of you might think to yourselves, yes, but I have lots of allegiances. And unfortunately, in the world that we live in, that is very true. We have so many different things that we have pledged allegiance to. Now, as we get into this part, I am in no way, shape, or form saying that to be patriotic is wrong. To, to, to say to yourself that I am proud to be an American, I'm not saying that's wrong. I would say that I would challenge you to maybe change that phrase a little bit. Rather than proud to be an American, what if we use the phrase, I am blessed to be an American? Or if you don't like that phrase, blessed, because it's too churchy, I am lucky to be an American. Because I think that we can all say that there are things about America that we may not like that much, but compared to other places, I am blessed to be an American. It's hard to be proud of something that I didn't do. I was just born here. I, I did nothing to be born here. And so what it is, is I am so grateful and so thankful that I live in a place that freedom reigns. And so I am blessed to be an American. What I am not is going to worship America. And that, and, and that looks like a million different things. 
consumerism, keeping up with the Joneses, pledging allegiance to an, ide- like an ideology. Right? There are so many of us that use our political party as an idol. Either we are sold out to the Republican agenda or we're sold out to the Democrat agenda, and we, we have made an idol out of these things. When we do that, we no longer are giving our soul allegiance over to God. Daniel at no time pledged allegiance to this king. What he did was say, hey, I can interpret these things you're, doing, you're dealing with. In fact, when the king demanded allegiance from Daniel and his three friends, they, they didn't rebel. They didn't start a big brawl. They simply stayed obedient. We see that when the king says, you are no, only allowed to pray to me in my statue, Daniel goes into his room and prays. He's going to keep doing what God has asked him to do throughout this entire book. His allegiance never changes. He might be living in Babylon. He may have been given a Babylonian name, but he is not a Babylonian. Just like we may be living in America, we may have American sounding names, but our allegiance And our citizenship, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, is not here. Ultimately, our citizenship is in heaven. That's why when Jesus teaches us to pray, or or the Lord's Prayer, it says, Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We long to bring the kingdom of God here with us. We don't long to bring American politics to the kingdom of heaven. That, that's not how this works. We, we, we long to restore and redeem a nation through the love and power of Jesus by being obedient to that. And so what that looks like sometimes is us standing in opposition to maybe what everything else looks like. Maybe for you, that looks like fighting for your churches to open. And and maybe you feel extremely convicted that that is your fight, that God has asked you, that 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 makes this place look more like the kingdom. And I would say, you're not wrong. (laughs) I, I believe when the church gathers together and people love each other, that this does look more like the kingdom of heaven. But the fight cannot simply be about opening your building, opening our building. The fight needs to be gathering of God's people to bring God's kingdom here on earth right now. We must keep our allegiance to the Most High God. And so we're in a very tricky time. And the greatest thing about tricky times is that Jesus has equipped us, God has equipped us, for these tricky times with something that we have talked about so many times at Connected NAS, the third way. We are asked to do the third way. Can I just tell you right now that what we're doing right now is the third way. I know that watching church from your home and and, and from a video and not being together is, is, is frustrating some of you. It's getting old to some of you. You just want everything to go back to normal. But what we're doing right now is a third way, right? There are two obvious options to this. When, when, when the government and the CDC and the World Health Organization ask us to, to close our doors so that we can help, I don't know, strive off or, or just slow down this, this pandemic, We could have done two things, obviously. We could have said, absolutely not. My First Amendment says I can gather freely wherever I want to, and we will continue to gather. Or we could have said, okay, close the doors, and whenever this thing blows over, we'll get back together again. But the third way is, hey, we've got this technology. We've got the internet. We've got video cameras. All of us have great video cameras in our pockets. You may not know this, but all the video you're seeing is all filmed on a phone. And so we all have, so the third way is, why don't we record a video and then we can watch it together the same time we always did. That, that's a third way option. And so sometimes when we're forced to make these black and white decisions, we need a third way to come in. And that third way has got to always be obedience and allegiance to the Most High God. That's where we start with that. 
How do we, how do we begin to make those choices of obedience and allegiance? Well, first of all, it, it starts in love. Our first reaction needs to be an action, a reaction of love. Loving our God and loving our neighbor has got to be what that's rooted in. That's the third way. If, if you find a way that doesn't line up with love, it's not the third way. It's not a good way. It's not a Christian way. It has to be rooted in love first. And so when we're brought with these things, we ask ourselves, is this rooted in love? Love for God, love for neighbor. So, so when Daniel has said, you cannot pray to your God, you have to pray to this statue, he could have said, you know what? No, I am going to pray to that. I'm going to pray to my God. And I'm going to do it right here in the courts. Or he could have just said, fine, I'm not going to pray. But no, he goes off and he begins to pray in his room. It's a third way. Even for his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are forced with this same idea. You will pray, you will kneel, or you will die. And they said, okay, here's the thing. We're not going to kneel, but we're also not going to start a rebellion. So if you want to throw us in a furnace, you can throw us in the furnace. That to them is their third way. They could have bowed, they could have started a brawl, a riot, but they didn't. They said, fine, here's our third way. Throw us in the furnace. Because I love what they say in chapter two. They say, if God, if you throw us in this furnace, God will deliver us. And even if he doesn't, he is still our God. That's third way. Sometimes when you do the choose a third way, you get thrown into a furnace. It's not to say that whenever you choose a third way, that something is going to, like it's always going to be fixed. No, you might get thrown into a furnace. And they knew very well they might be dead, but they were going to keep their allegiance. So when we give our allegiance over to anything, but especially it seems like today to a country or to an empire, if you will. Now I know we're not an empire, but we, we are a power. And when we give our allegiance to that, what happens when that allegiance doesn't line up with our allegiance to Christ? doesn't line up with our allegiance to God. Because I will tell you this, all empires are going to go away. They're not going to last forever. The only rule in empire that's going to last forever is that of the Most High God, where it says that it, he reigns forever and ever and ever with the Son of Man at his right hand. Those, that is the only kingdom that's going to last. So we need to make sure as we navigate these troubled times, that we are navigating with our allegiance to one, the Most High God, by our convictions given to us by Christ. Not our convictions giving us to either one of the political parties. Or if you're a libertarian, we'll go three political parties. Those are not the convictions that we live, live by. Those are not the allegiances that we cling to. The allegiance we cling to is to that of Christ. That is what makes us unique. That is what made Daniel stand out. That in the midst of everything, he kept his allegiance to the Most High God. And he did so in a consistent, loving way. He still went and interpreted these dreams. He still was kind to the king. And, and, and he still recognized that he lived amongst a foreign people. But he was never a citizen of Babylon. We live amongst people but we are not earthly citizens. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, the most high kingdom, the one that reigns forever and ever and ever. So uh, as we make our allegiances, as we talk on social media, your allegiances show when you type. Can we keep our allegiances made to loving God with all our heart, with all our mind and all our soul? and loving our neighbor as ourself. When our allegiance is based on that, it is allegiance to Christ first and Christ alone. Let our decisions be made by that allegiance. We're gonna go into connecting time and I just want this to be a time of prayer for you. Is there a place that you are aligned to? Is there an ideology that you're more aligned to than that of the most high God? than that of loving your neighbor and loving your God? Is there an allegiance that you are clinging to more tightly than that allegiance that is 
the gospel and the message of the Most High God. If there is, this is a great time to get rid of it. <laughs> and I'm not saying you get rid of it by going down and taking off your American flag. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying, please, do not put that flag and your obedience and your allegiance to that flag ahead of your obedience to Christ because there will come a time that you are going to have to be, you're going to have to choose. Do I kneel to the king or do I stay obedient to Christ? Do I kneel to the king or do I stay obedient to the Christ? We're going to have to make that decision. And you might as well right now wrestle with that allegiance. Before Daniel ever went to Babylon, he knew where his allegiance lied. Because this too, this world is full of beasts that will pass away. So we must align ourselves to the one who will reign forever and ever. Take this time to pray as a family. Take communion if you'd like. Break the bread, the juice. Light some candles. Turn your coffee table into an altar. Go on the website. Hit the give button. And oh, what a great way to declare allegiance, right? That your allegiance is to something bigger. It's not to keeping up with your neighbors. It's to actually building the kingdom of God. Go and give online today. Whatever you need to do in connecting time to make sure that you check your allegiance. That's what we need to do. So go. Declares your majesty. You 
Father God, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my allegiance. I have this vision in my mind right now of of kneeling before you and you take this fiery sword and you knight me and I am ready to be that. Dub me, sir, (laughs) knight of your kingdom. I give you my allegiance wholeheartedly. Father, I pray that that you search my life and my heart for any places that I am aligned to something else, that I have made an idol out of something that maybe is good, it's fine, but to make an idol out of it is never going to be good. So Lord, just show me those things that I have made, that I've declared allegiance to. And Lord, give me the faith and the obedience of Daniel so that I can live life in a different way. I thank you so much. And I give my whole life over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May you be people that realize and recognize that you are blessed to be an American. But your allegiance is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Kingdom of God. Have a great week. Can't wait to touch bases again. Trust in Jesus just to take him at his word and just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the rock bottom wanting to turn away and run I have lost my hope and I've been filled with doubt but God he said his work in me is not done there's no struggle greater than the power of our Savior there's no hate stronger than the love of God our Father. To keep your faith in the good times and the bad. When you've given all you have, everything you have. To keep your faith in the blessing and the pain. In the sun and in the rain. When things will never be the same You gotta keep your faith Oh my God and Father Your faithfulness reminds us That we are in your presence here And standing on your promises nothing will ever break us you will never leave us or forsake us oh there's no struggle greater than the power of our savior and there's no hate stronger than the love of god our father keep your faith in the good times and the bad when you've given all you have everything you have keep your feet in the blessing and the pain in the sun and in the rain when things will never be the same you gotta 
Thank you.